Yeah, it's not over. How's it sound like that? It sounds low. Water? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone want some water? Does anybody know AV? <laughs> <laughs> That's a little. That's a little better, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Try that. Does my? There we go. I think we're back. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. We're in business. Fantastic. I'm hired. That's right. This whole venture capital thing doesn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, we'll get started. Hello. Welcome, everyone, to the ROI of AI panel. We're super excited to have y'all here and kick this thing off. My name's Steve Meyer. I am a co-founder for Kung Fu AI, one of our sponsors here, and we are an AI consultancy. We work with a lot of clients from readiness to helping them get their start in artificial intelligence. So a really interesting topic for myself and many of you here. I think it's a very necessary topic and a very important topic to have good conversations around the success factors of artificial intelligence, especially from different perspectives from the technology perspective, the business perspective, what does success look like and how do we create it in this new space? So before we begin and kick this thing off, a couple quick shout outs. First of all, thank you to Capital Factory for being fantastic hosts and setting this whole thing up and allowing us to bring everyone together. And I'm really excited to give a shout out to Austin AI. So if you're not familiar, and I imagine very few of you are, of Austin AI or even City AI is an international community of practitioners of artificial intelligence. And the goal is to really bring people together to learn from one another, challenge one another, and perhaps work together to build this incredible technology 
through Knowledge Share. And it's very, very big overseas, and they're only starting here in North America with San Francisco, New York, and Austin. So if any of you all are interested in learning more about that, or even starting your own chapter, come talk with me because we'd love to build this community in North America. I think it's a very, very important thing to do. So uh, with that, we'll get started. I want to introduce my colleague and co-founder and CTO of Kung Fu AI, Matt Cohen. Matt is the perfect moderator for this discussion because he has backgrounds in both the technical, the venture side, as well as a serial entrepreneur in machine learning. And his most recent venture uh, is with Kung Fu. So I'm excited to pass this off to Matt, also a venture partner here at Capital Factory. So really, really good perspective. Matt, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, choosing us over one of the many open bars. <laughs> um, hopefully you'll be able to catch that later. Um, so uh, I'm gonna let my uh, co-panelists uh, introduce themselves. But before I do, I'm gonna, I wanna briefly ask, um, how many of you are, would consider yourselves to be more technical? If you could like raise your hand if you're more technical. Okay, that's like a pretty good, I'd say probably half. Um, and uh, how many of you folks uh, are actually using AI? Uh, then the, I'm assuming the rest of you are on the more on the business side. So, of the folks on the business side, how many of you are actually implementing AI and machine learning projects uh, right now? Oh, that's a pretty good, pretty good list as well. Great, um, terrific. Well, uh, why don't I uh, let my co-panelists introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll get to it. So, go ahead. All right, thank you for having me here tonight. My name is Jacob Mullins, I'm with Shasta Ventures. We're a San Francisco Bay Area based venture capital firm. I've been around for 13 years. And we focus on really three areas of technology, which is actually all of technology, but, or most of it, but it's uh, enterprise software, um, consumer products, both software and hardware. And I spend most of my time in emerging platforms. So that is AI, uh, VR, AR, crypto, um, and kind of the new things that are going to be affecting the way that consumers or businesses interact with uh, technology. And we focus traditionally on the Series A uh, or the Series B. Hi, my name is Christine Doig. I'm a data scientist. I'm a practitioner. Uh, I've been in the space for over eight years. Uh, my last, uh, the last company I was, uh, it's a um, startup here in Austin called Anaconda. Uh, which is one of the uh, leading data science platforms uh, with over 8 million users uh, all over the world that are using it as their de facto platform for doing data science machine learning. Uh, and most recently, I'm an independent data science consultant for companies helping them uh, implement data science uh, in their organizations, both uh, technically, but also uh, organs like in the organization, how to make changes to adopt data science. Awesome. Kirk Coburn, I'm with Shell Technology Ventures. We are the venture capital arm of uh, Royal Dutch Shell. Um, we are a um, uh, venture capital firm that really tries to do three things. One is lower cost of existing operations. Um, secondly is make our existing operations more sustainable and then invest in technologies that, we, that will help us um, thrive through the energy transition. Um, we typically invest between two to 20 million. Um, we take minority interest in companies. We love to partner with people. Um, and we really are looking for great entrepreneurs that can help us solve really, really hard problems. Terrific. And uh, obviously, you guys are here at Capital Factory. Uh, we're the largest startup hub in, in Texas. Um, but many people don't know that the Capital Factory Venture Fund is the mo most active early stage technology investor in the state. Uh, we did 53 investments last year um, and uh, uh, and love to collaborate and uh, are looking for some of the best companies as well. So, uh, okay, so let me, uh, let, me let me jump in. So uh, I'll start with saying like, what is AI? Like, when you think about AI, um, how, do you, how do you think about what it is, what it isn't? Um, maybe we'll start with Jacob and kind of go down. Um. As I think about it, and I, I tend to think about how humans process things and look at things and work with things, I think about AI as the ability, or the striving towards the ability for computers and machines to be able to um, replicate or assist uh, in many of the ways that humans process things as well. Um, 
and over time that will get more sophisticated. But for now, it's uh, for now it's it's assistance. Yeah. So um, I think like I don't know anymore what AI means. Uh, to be honest, um, I think uh, it has got so much hype, so much hype that when I read about AI, I don't actually know what the person means when they're using that word. Um, as a practitioner, I think I'm more comfortable using the different types of like learning. Um, and, uh, and and sometimes people mean AI, they are referring to just like general machine learning. Other times they're thinking about neural networks and deep learning. Other times they're just like thinking about reinforcement learning, which is another type of learning. So I, I prefer to just use those terms um, when they're uh, you know more, more appropriately and, and more accurately. Uh, and then the term that I like the most is actually data science. I think like uh, that's why we call ourselves data scientists, I think. And then like AI is just like another tool, another set of methods uh, that uh, is a toolbox that you can use to solve uh, problems uh, with data. So how, how, just a related question, how would you define data science then? Yeah, so for, uh, for me, data science, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> So for me, data science, um, it, it's actually like a, all this like, it combines like all the complete cycle of like data collection, um, understanding your data, modeling and learning it, and then actually like deploying it to your production system, the your engineering system. So it's the full um, circle and for which um, machine learning and like statistical machine learning, uh, deep learning, it's just like the modeling part of it. So it would be a third step. And I think that's how I like to think about it, like the holistic view and then like machine learning and AI is just like one tool in that cycle that you use. I think I'd just say whatever she said. Um, <laughs> I look at AI in a, in a different way, since in a more tactical way. To me, AI for us means um, keeping people safe and removing people from very dangerous things that we do. Um, that, that to me is kind of how I see AI. So that, that, that's a great lead in. Can, maybe you can give us an example of how you guys are leveraging AI today um, in a way that would be interesting to the audience and, and is important to you. Sure, so, so one of the things we do as a venture capital team is we invest across the entire energy value chain, oil and gas to new energy. So we have a pretty active new energies business. And in new energies, that means the power business, so generation of renewable electricity uh, or power, as most people would, would think about it, transporting that power and then, and then business models and ideas around uh, helping consumers, which could be you and I too, and uh, large companies consume power and be, be smarter about how they use energy. It's also new fuels, um, which includes electricity and then mobility. Um, on the oil and gas side, I'll give you just a tactical, you know, another way that, that might be um, foreign to many people here, so that's why I'm going to use it. Um, what's really hard is when people are putting pipes together. Um, it's Pipes are really muddy when they're drilling, and it, it's really complicated because you have to see, when you put two pipes together, you have to thread them. If you don't thread them correctly, they break, and bad things happen. It's really expensive. Um, and so we've been trying to figure out how do you actually use cameras and artificial intelligence to know that two pipes can be connected together. Sounds really simple, but it actually turns out to be a really, really hard problem. And we've had a lot of people, some of the world's best people look at it. It's like, that's a really complicated issue. It seems simple, but unfortunately we have to, many times, especially in freezing and harsh conditions, send people outside to do that work. And that's when you do that, you're putting people's lives at jeopardy. And that's where we really are trying to solve things with AI in the middle, um, but they're able to sort of control the whole process in building products that are powered by AI. By AI. So, um, so in particular, maybe Jacob, you could talk about maybe a little bit about how you see the adoption of AI coming and how startups are, uh, are helping larger companies uh, be successful in some of these things. Absolutely. So the real question or answer to your first question was, what isn't AI, yep. right? Like we're, yeah, we yeah. see it yep. everywhere. Uh, every pitch we see has AI in it. And um, it's AI or machine learning or neural nets or it's CNNs, it's just everywhere. And, and most of the time, um, it's just different shades of that. So, you know, the way we think about it is AI, and I kind of made a comment earlier when we were discussing before the panel, like when you say you're building an AI product, it's kind of like you're saying, you're building a SaaS product, or you're building a mobile product. Like, okay, but that's not why it's an interesting product. Like, what? how are you applying that? 
And so we really focus on the end user experience and the actual product that's getting there. Um, so specifically, um, we kind of see, at least in enterprise, very large horizontal type software like a Salesforce. Um, then there's SaaS 2.0, which is much more kind of vertical focused software. Um, and then we think create better outcomes and more automated um, uh, kind of honed outcomes. And so that's the focus that we're, we're spending a lot of time on right now, which is figuring out how is data science or machine learning applied to what you're doing. Um, and frankly, if, you, if you're not using it today, there's probably parts of it that you should be. So, uh, so my next question is for those of you who are wanting to implement AI, machine learning, data science in a bigger way within your organization, um, Christine, maybe you can speak to a couple of the ways that people can justify applying some of these techniques uh, when they're working within the organizations uh, and talking to people who aren't necessarily very technical, how to decide when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate, and just how they can advocate for using some of these techniques within the organization. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think when I start uh, with my clients, um, they're trying to like figure out like how, like you know they they they've kind of heard about AI and deep learning, and they they're trying to find a problem to a solution instead of like start. Oh, we have uh, deep learning. Where the, where can we put deep learning in our organization? And then that's when I see the projects uh, fail because like you don't have a clear goal um, to begin with. Um, and then when you start seeing like okay, these are all uh, you know the, the like the uh, challenges that we're facing in our organization, um, you can start looking into like okay, uh, what are the priorities and how can like the existing um, you know tools and methods that exist can apply to, to solve each of those problems. So that's how I approach it. Um, how about organizationally uh, when you're trying to advocate for allocating resources? Yeah. Um, you know, how can someone put together an argument to justify, uh, you know, making an investment in some of these in some of these tools and techniques? Yeah. So what I've seen, um, kind of like the the, uh, the different companies, uh, kind of medium sized and larger companies, is that they they started a few years ago by hiring one data scientist, and they said, okay, now now I'm doing data science, now I'm doing AI, I'm doing have this, I've hired this one person that can solve everything, right? And it was like, okay, that's that that didn't work, right? Like that poor person. <laughs> Uh, trying to like bring AI to that company like was uh, struggling. So now I think we've we've moved a little bit like beyond that, and they're uh, realizing that it's not gonna be like one person. And sometimes it falls into like engineering. Sometimes like um, there's other companies that even have their chief algorithms officer. Uh, <laughs> and so like it's a it's a full wow. uh, part of uh, the organization that's that's certainly the in the executive team. Um, and so we're starting to see that like. People are thinking more in that way, and also how that it, it integrates uh, with engineering, right? Because like a lot of times we've also seen like failures when um, they just like had just like data scientists, and most of them were like you know PhDs and could like read a lot of papers and like prototype things, but then like the moving into production to like integrating with your engineering systems uh, just like would fall through because you were not thinking um, about the system holistically. You were just thinking of like okay, this research I have this data set, this is my prediction. But actually, you have to think about the whole architecture with engineering, with the business case, um, uh, and not just like data science independently. That's great. Um, so, Kirk, you were talking earlier about some of the uh, challenges to actually put it, bringing AI to bear at Shell. So, maybe you could elaborate a little bit about about why why would you not use AI, and what are some challenges to really bringing it across the organization? Well, one of the simple answers to AI is, is the whole black box thing that you were talking about earlier. Um, again, when we're making decisions that we make, we do very dangerous work. Um, the world needs our products because every one of us in this room uses electricity and, or, or, or flies on airplanes and does things like that. But extracting those resources is very, very difficult and usually very, very dangerous. So ultimately, at the end of the day, we don't want to replace somebody with a machine that says, let, let me figure it out for you. And I'm not really going to tell you how I did it. And if something goes wrong, I can't really tell you what happened. That's our biggest concern. So ultimately, um, for those of you that want to sell to us, we're going to, you know, the ultimate decision maker is going to be the person that's responsible for people. Um, when I joined Shell, one of the things I think was the most powerful is when people get hurt, 
Um, we have 93,000 people. It doesn't. It does happen in our business, and and the emails you read. I mean, we really care about our people. Like I've never seen a company that cares more about the the the, the safety and health of our people. That's the biggest issue. It's like we need to make sure that when something, when we transition something over to something called AI, it works, and that that someone is ultimately held accountable because we care for you know these are people that we love, and so I think that is. Um, been a barrier because the decision makers are saying, are, are you going to be able to guarantee that you're better than some, someone, you know, than me or you? So that's been a challenge. Um, uh, I think that's, I can, I can go on, but there's others. That's great. Um, so Jacob, uh, you know, there was about $12 billion invested in AI companies last year. Um, do you see specific industries or use cases that are driving the bulk of the applications right now? Or is it pretty just evenly distributed? Or how do you think about where, you know, the, the, there's a famous William Gibson quote, uh, the future is here, it's just not equally distributed. So, uh, so how, how do you see the adoption of AI in certain sectors versus others? And where, where is the revenue gonna come from to justify this huge investment in, over the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, we see it, like I said, across the entire spectrum. So to, I'll choose two areas just to... Is evenly distributed? Uh, <laughs> maybe not in like razors, like Dollar Shave Club. But uh, although they probably use it for optimizing lot, yeah. their own business and optimizing the target emails. And, um, but, I'd, you know, I'd say enterprise software is one big area. Um, so if you're, it, it doesn't have to be enterprise. Software as a, as a business. You can sell it to enterprises, you can sell, sell it to small businesses. Um, but software generally is one giant area where people are actively interested in buying that. Um, and there's a lot of legacy software solutions that are just starting to get a little older and uh, you can be competitive and innovative in the insights that you're providing. It's kind of like over the, you know, eight, you know, five to eight to 10 years ago, we were all talking about big data. Like this panel would have been a big data panel. <laughs> how do we, do, what, how do we get the big data? How do we, what do we do with the big data? And we've all realized like, holy crap, you can't do anything with all that data. You need to learn from it. You need to like pull out insights. And that's what essentially what I refer to as kind of artificial intelligence in the enterprise, which is how do you take all that data that we're collecting on oil rigs in enterprises from our cars and make things better for that customer? Um, so enterprise software, software generally, is a big one. The other side I'll talk about is in, um, I'd say like robotics, uh, both the hardware and the software side of robotics. So we spend a lot of time there. We've messed in a lot of hardware software and software robotics companies. And in those cases, AI is core to the experience because it's ac it actually is the product. It is not enabling optimization of the product or the data, it is the product. Um, in companies like Fetch Robotics, which is an industrial indoor robot that takes, uh, takes pallets and, and, and boxes from one side of the warehouse to the other autonomously, it, it uses AI to navigate to be able to see. Um, I work a lot in, in uh, computer vision, and so you're seeing companies that are using it to optimize picking of strawberries in fields and enabling robotic arms, because strawberries, interestingly, is one crop that grows year-round in the United States, and they don't, it doesn't come ripe all at the same time. Um, and so you actually take tractors through, and, or people will go through and, and pick strawberries. Um, and in this case, it's able to actually identify which ones are ripe and then use robotic arms to pick it. So two big areas are kind of, uh, you know, are, those, are such, but um, I mean, we would, we'd be interested in looking at it in, in, in anything. I'd say the end thing for us is, what's the business problem you're solving? We're not looking to invest in AI for AI's sake. And our fund, we tend to focus on end user experiences, end user products. So we're less focused on component technologies. So um, black boxes or amazing technologies that can enable. Um, that's just not us. There are a lot of funds that do do that. Um, so. That's great. Um, so um, the, I guess the, the next question maybe for Christine is how do you keep up with the rapid change, actually for all three of you really, but Christine, more from a practitioner point of view, Jacob maybe from an uh, investor point of view, and uh, Kirk maybe from an implementation point of view. How, how, do you, uh, how do you keep up with everything that's going on? It's, just, it's like a tsunami of information, new products, it feels like new papers come out every week, new packages come out every almost every day. Uh, how, do, how do you keep up? You don't. Uh, I think uh, I, like, I was trying to like build my own AI to like summarize all that happened. <laughs> that's that's right. like, so There's like, an application for it. Yeah, yeah that, that, that would be a good application, just like an AI that 
like helped you keep up today with like everything that's happening in the industry. Are there certain sources that you that you tend to uh, read or follow? Yeah, so um, there's uh, some like like there's different areas. Right, one is like research. The other one is kind of like the open source libraries um, that come up from uh, different like I think I follow a lot of like the blog posts from um, major companies like uh, Google and Uber and Facebook. Um, I think Airbnb, Stitch Fix, there's a lot of like good data science blog posts out, out there, Netflix, um, that talk a lot about, about how they're applying um, those like uh, those methods to solve their problems. Um, yeah. And then like there's some also, um, you know, the uh, Gardner Magic Quadrant for machine learning data science platform just came out last week. So that then there's also some kind of the, that industry uh, information. So yeah, so you're getting sources from uh, all over the place. So, it's hard, I don't have the answer. Maybe maybe someone can build that AI for me. So how, how do you keep up? Uh, man, I'd say we have the luxury of looking, of being able to look at data to see what works. Um, and so we, you know, when we look at companies who are um, raising funding, we'll dig in to, to look at their, their customer metrics. Um, so a lot of that has to do with sales, uh, churn, uh, the, the standard SaaS metrics, but that tells us what's working and what's not. So that's a luxury because then I don't have to spend my time reading a lot of the papers and trying to find out because there's so many amazing. Uh, uh, there's several. We, we you know we invest in a company called Mana. Um, Mana is a Silicon Valley based company that takes you know, able to tap into different data sources and put it into a model so that, so that we can get you know make some actionable insights on on what we're doing. And, and the thing about about us is we collect data on everything. It's just too much data. So for us, uh, when we talk about AI in this space, like a little win is a victory. That's, those are, that's challenging. No, we haven't solved that yet. But So um, to us, it's like, just solve it, get going. I mean, for us, we're like, take action, let's solve it and, and move forward. And if something better comes along, maybe we'll introduce that. Um, on the other spectrum, um, there, there's some science that's so disciplined, especially like petrophysics and, and uh, geophysics and the geophysics physicists don't talk to the geologists who don't talk to the reservoir engineers because you're you've grown up and spent your whole life in silos learning a discipline um, it's not AI it is hey why don't we all talk together um, it, it's more about change management it, that to me is maybe the big issue here it's change management so there's some great companies that says, hey, we're just gonna focus on, like we have AI, but maybe we'll just focus on kind of training people how to talk together. Um, that to us, is, those are some big wins, um, something that um, that we're excited about. Um, so, uh, so Christine, there, there's, uh, there's sort of a, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a sort of a reputation among, among, you know, the data scientists are great at building models, but they build things that aren't really deployable, and then they have to be re-implemented again. Are you seeing what? How are you seeing that change, and what do you think is driving that change? And how can data scientists work to building things that are more uh, more easily deployable, and, and can you know you don't necessarily have to have this two-stage uh, implementation process? Yeah, I think uh, the first uh, thing that I see is like working closer with engineering. Um, so instead of like a lot of companies thought that data science was something completely different than engineering, kind of like started their own like data science organization, like siloed away from engineering, like the, their whole like um, goal was like, okay, I've deployed, like I've written like this model, and then I, I provide this REST API, and of course, um, the person, like the data scientist that wrote this like REST API, um, like just like, didn't think about the whole architecture, right? And like it, it, it was like a recipe API that maybe like one person could hit at a time because like it, they just like didn't think about like you know what actually goes um, into uh, building a scalable um, uh, risk API solution for a machine learning algorithm. Um, so I think they're starting to realize more more that and um, and I think also data science is starting to uh, get better at uh, engineering best practices. Um, uh, themselves because they're also realizing that and realizing that um, just like running a script on your laptop is not doing data science. Um, and so uh, I think that the partnering with engineering and also like this, the skill sets evolving um, into also engineering best practice is like is what's changing in the industry. That's great. Well, um, I had the pleasure of going to the uh, Cloudera annual uh, meeting uh, a couple weeks ago. 
And uh, one of the things that was most interesting there were all the different case studies of how people were using their technologies to implement really, really interesting projects. So maybe just as an example, maybe each of you guys could give an example of uh, a case study of implementation of AI that was delivering real value and that you know maybe something about that could be replicated at some of the companies that these folks uh, work at. Feel free to go with any order you like. I'm, I'm always looking for interesting case studies. So. You first. <laughs> oh well. Um, let's see. Let, let me. I'll, I'll just give it. I'll give one example. Um, so uh, one of the examples I saw was from Procter and Gamble, and um, you know they everything is all of their products are in boxes, and the boxes are loaded onto pallets, and whenever uh, whenever somebody uh, whenever they deliver a shipment to a customer, um, there's a particular number of units that they're, that they're delivering. And in some cases, that requires breaking down a pallet or opening up a box. And a human has to do that, and that's a very expensive process. So they've implemented a system where they actually figure out when to ship free extra product because delivering the extra product is cheaper than paying somebody to break down the pallet or open up the box. And so they have, a, they have an AI-based system that makes that prediction and figures out when to break down the pallets and boxes and when not to. I thought that was nice and straightforward and totally makes sense. And you know, this Procter & Gamble is working at the scale where this one uh, change made an enormous impact. NFL football quarterback, and, and he was, uh, Striver was having an event, and I, I, it was interesting. He says, you know, he was just at an event earlier today, so it was interesting as I used to use Striver to see the plays I'm gonna run. And when, I, when I'm using this headset, it, it, the, it, I'll see the play formation, and then it'll scroll across the screen what the name of the play is. He says, when I'm actually calling a play, it, it, he's been working on it in training camp, and he says, after a while, after training camp and a, and a, a few more months, he says, when I'd call a play, I'd see it in my mind. He's like, so um, he says it actually really enhanced my ability to learn plays and enhanced my ability to react and execute faster. And he said that year he, he, he was, you know, quarterback of the year, whatever the stats are. I'm sure some of you might know his stats, but he's like, it actually made me a much better player. And I thought that's interesting. So reinforcing um, his ability to learn and, and learn quicker. I, I thought that was pretty interesting to me. That's great. It's kind of at the intersection of AI and augmented reality. I mean, I think these two technologies will go really well together, and we'll see a lot of use cases like that. Um, I don't have that cool of a case study. <laughs> <laughs> it's not mine. Um, but because usually, like when I go into like the the companies I work for, um, it's it's kind of like more understanding uh, how AI can help in like uh, solving some of the problems they have with their current business. So it's kind of like the boring stuff. It's like, how do you get more leads? How do you convert more leads? How do you keep customers happy? And so it's then within like those parts of the organization and helping apply AI to that. Like, how can you better understand like what you know? Why are your customers complaining? Um, and using like just like natural language processing uh, and deep learning models to like like summarize that information in a meaningful way. If you you have a lot of uh, like customers and, and and traffic, right? And so. I think that's like what one of the things that I'm, I'm, the applications are interesting too, but what really uh, interests me in like AI is like seeing how it uh, gets applied into like every business uh, and makes a change in like what uh, those businesses care about, right? Like how do you get more customers, how do you keep your customers um, uh, happy? Um, so that, that's, that's my, my experience. Well, I mean, in reality, most of the actual first generation applications are going to be relatively modest applications that deliver a lot of value. You might as well start with the easy stuff. Um, so I think most of the most of the use cases are not super exciting, other than they deliver a lot of value, and you can do them relatively easily. So, uh, do you have do you have a favorite? A couple favorites? So yeah, well, we'll go down a little bit of a rabbit hole um, here, uh, where I'm spending a lot of time, and and I think that the camera. And now we're going to computer vision. I think the camera is actually one of the largest platform opportunities like we've seen in many, many years. I think it's as big as the whole AI like, opportunity by itself. And what I mean by that is that the camera, which is now a device that all of us have, actually maybe more than one camera on us right now. In this room, there's probably more cameras, uh, well, there are more cameras than all of us individually, but 
the uh, thanks to cell phones, thanks to connected like constant connectivity, thanks to neural networks and very quick computation. Now the camera is actually a data input device. It's a it's the highest fidelity data input device that we've ever known. The only one that we know that's better is this data input device, which is our eyeball, and that's connected to this neural net, which is our brain. And finally, computers are reaching the the opportunity to be able to comp compute things in real time. And so, for that reason, I am like fascinated and going super deep down into this rabbit hole of if, if the camera is a very inexpensive data sensor as a piece of hardware, what are the different software applications that can be written on top of it? And they're infinite. Um, and you know, one of one of them, which is interesting, is you know, Internet of Things. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about sensors and connected devices. Uh, Kirk, I'm sure you know a lot about sensors and connected devices. They're everywhere in all of the piping. And you know, one of the interesting things we realize is those sensors, when you install them, it's a hard cost. Uh, they're there to do one specific utility. But if you need to be flexible and change things, you can't. They're relatively installed and fixed for one specific thing. However, if you install a camera in there, you can put different software on that camera anytime and accomplish most of the sorry most of the uh, of the data that you would get from a sensor itself. And so your example about putting a camera inside of a pipe, that's super interesting, right? You might have had a pressure sensor in the pipe before that uh, that was able to tell, but now the camera is multifaceted. So, um, and cameras affect everything from piping uh, to uh, optimization of spaces to driving our cars across long distances. Um, the Tesla's operated with, it navigates with eight optical cameras only. It uses radar for safety, but it uses eight, eight optical cameras to navigate. So for me, the camera is this huge opportunity um, that I think we all could be using. Um, in most businesses, it's very relevant. Yeah, it, you, you touch on a couple of things that I've seen in a lot of, a lot of companies and a lot of business situations where, you know, in many ways, machine learning AI is a terrible way to solve a problem. It, it takes a lot of data, it doesn't always get the right answer. You don't necessarily know why it's doing what it's doing. You need expensive and specialized expertise. The tools are brand new and very fragile. So there, there are lots and lots of good reasons not to use it. And you know, uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned autonomous vehicles. You mentioned uh, you know computer vision, robotics. These are areas where traditional types of software development we don't even really know where to start. You know, if, if, if uh, somebody were to ask me, you know, how do I build a system that'll send out a bunch of emails? I know how to do that. Uh, I can write that myself. But if someone were to tell me, okay, I want you to make a robot that can walk, I don't even really know how I walk. <laughs> so I would, don't, wouldn't really know how to begin uh, programming a robot to do it, right? So there are definitely a number of areas where only some of these newer techniques have had any measure of success, uh, you know, at the level where they're practical for a wide range of applications. So I definitely see that, and so that, that definitely resonates with something I've seen. I think you, all, you were also mentioning, this kind of touches on Chris, what Christine was saying, that in a sense we're sort of in a third wave of what companies are doing with data. The first wave was, let's save our data. So let's just like collect it, put it somewhere, we don't really know what we're gonna do with it, we know it's important, let's just, let's just start keeping it. The second wave was more, let's see what we have, let's, let's put, Queer, you know, let's let's put analytics and query interfaces. Let's put dashboards into things and more like rear face, you know, rear, rear look, you know. Um, and now we're entering a phase where we're using data to make predictions and to look forward. Um, and um, I mean, in a sense, prediction is what you know. When I think about what machine learning is about, it's about using data to make predictions. And, um, and predictions are part of every business process. And so as uh, developments in machine learning drive down the cost of prediction, just like anything we, where the cost goes down, you see more of it. So not only will we start to be automating the process of prediction in, the daily, in our daily lives as business people and as individuals, um, we're also gonna start to see applications that were not possible because predictions were too expensive uh, or too complicated. So we're, it, it's just a, it's a fascinating time, and I, I tend to think of it from the standpoint of what is what is the data that you have and what are the problems that need to be solved. Um, and I see that I see that over and over again. So it's interesting to see the different uh, approaches there. Yeah, so, and, I, and I also think like the like the next uh, kind of like 
wave, it's not going to be just about making, making predictions, but it's like about decision making. Mm -hmm. How do you automate decision making? Uh, you know, you don't you don't care like what you're you're going to sell tomorrow. That that prediction itself, like how, what how can I intervene with the system to actually get more sales than what I'm getting with the prediction right now? Right? It's like how do I how do I interact with the system um, to like move that prediction in, in the way I want? Um, so I think that's like a very interesting, and we're seeing uh, efforts in like reinforcement learning. Um, and, and how are the point those systems in the real world so that they're autonomous and they're making those decisions and they're, they're interviewing with the, with, the, with the system you have at hand um, to not just predict because like, you know, with a prediction, say, okay, this is like, you know, it's gonna rain tomorrow, well, great, but that means that I probably need to make the decision like take my umbrella, right? So like if we have a system that like automates that, the, the taking the umbrella, not just like saying it's gonna rain, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities there as well. That's great. Um, so uh, we have a little less than 20 minutes. I was thinking maybe we could just take some questions. Um, sure. So uh, we're, we're very open. We're happy to answer whatever you like. Um, uh, yeah, so go ahead and uh, I'll, re we'll, I'll repeat the question. Sure, so my understanding was, again, we're talking a little bit about ROI. That's a great question. So, so how do you evaluate and justify the ROI of data science projects? I can take that internally oh, as a customer. Um, when we make investments, uh, one of the things we do is we also work on a deployment model. So if we deploy this technology internally, how much money do we save? Um, that's, a, that, that's a big part of our analysis, is we're trying to figure out if we deploy this, how much money are we saving as a company from doing what we're doing today it's a it, it's actually not that complicated but it is hard to, to build because we have to make a bunch of assumptions and estimations but at the end of the day it's comparing if we're doing it as is today if we deploy this what's the delta i mean it's that simple and that's to us the roi um not even on the not, not from an investment from an irr or cash on cash is what uh, only I care about, but but from your question, we only care about okay, great. If I deploy your technology, how much money am I going to save? And it's all about you know we're a business, not a charity, um, and we don't care about cool stuff. Especially our executives, we can put you in front of our senior executives, and they're like, how much money am I saving? So is it more about savings, or is it about additional revenue opportunities, or or both? Well, that's I mean same it's yeah. same same idea. I mean for for and the and the and the oil and gas business is about uptime. So if I lose 10 minutes of production or, or, or a day of production, that's a lot of money. So same idea. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure, go ahead. So you talk about time savings, money savings. Our company, we sell a product that helps accelerate the model of the We're very focused on the profit. So the question was, was about uh, how do you evaluate productivity gains versus other kinds of gains? I mean, uh, I'm a, a paper entrepreneurialist. Um, I grew up as a finance guy, and I'm great at convincing people what a model can say. And that's the thing about great. That's why every entrepreneur that shows me a business model, I'm like, throw it out. I'm like, let's let's start again and let them walk me through how you got there. Um, productivity gains is one of the most um, uh, difficult things in the world to get across to someone. Finance people are like, huh? Business people are like, what? It doesn't make any tactical, it just it doesn't make any real sense to most of us. It sounds really good on paper, but try to, if you're trying to convince an attorney to print, put this in, on, in an advertisement that we improve productivity by 5X, like prove that. That, that to me is where I find uh, decision makers, investors, um, financiers, and others lose steam. So that to me is a real, I'd approach it in a different way. Um, and since this is the, the topic of the talk, so maybe you can talk a little bit about it. Right? Yeah, so um, my uh, approach is maybe like at a lower level. 
Um, and so uh, when I'm working with my clients, we first start with the goal, right? And so like maybe it's like custom measure, you know, like the goal is like increase uh, customer engagement. So once we have clearly what that goal is, then like we can have a metric, right? When we say, okay, uh, customer engagement as like, you know, the, the time they spend on like our, using our service um, or whatever other metric it can be. And then we can um, compare, we build like an algorithm that uh, that can help, okay, if we give these recommendations or if um, we make these changes on the website, we claim that we predict that you're gonna get like the default experience and so like a number of your users, you're showing this improved experience for a certain amount of time and you're like measuring that and then you compare and then you can say, oh, it did affect, the, you know, it, it, it was true, our prediction was true and actually we got double the engagement. Um, and that's when like you can present that to the business and, and, and say, this is the return on the investment. We made this project with two, three, four, five people um, with a, this amount of time and uh, we got this outcome and this, this metric, this, this proof. And then you can say, okay, now you can deploy to everyone um, and uh, so that's usually the, the process we follow. And I think what Christine's saying are great KPIs that help you focus on the product itself. I think at the end of the day, when, when I talk to companies, it's about revenue at the end of the day, right? Like that's the end goal. You either make more money or you save more money. And so whatever the product is that you're selling, figure out how does that make more money or how does that save more money? And in most of these cases, you're probably gonna have to invent your own structure of that success metric and apply it to that business. But, you know, apply it to their end revenue, making money or saving money. Um, and, you know, it, that's directly related to the health of the business. Do you see more making money or more saving money in terms of the value propositions? It's a stronger sell if you're making more money. Yeah. Um, optimization in sales tends to be in large enterprises when you're having to cut, you know, really optimize public companies and keep costs low. Um, but in the early days, of that's you know smaller than Fortune 500 companies, it's making more money. So back in the good old days in the 90s, probably before many of you were born, um, <laughs> I was at a computer hardware company here in Austin, um, and we were trying to sell um, the size of hard drives. And we're like, yeah, it's whatever, you know, one gigabyte. It was before one gigabyte. And I don't even remember. It was like one gigabyte. They were like, what does that mean? We're like, it's one gig, dummy. They were, then someone came up with this great idea. It's like, hey, that's actually 60 songs you can put on your hard drive. And people were like, yes. So converting it into stuff that people actually know, which I love to more, make more money, save more money, it, to me, really works. So it's just a marketing thing, but I think it does work. Awesome. Uh, how about in the back there? So I think a lot of us love this idea of AI, but it's So to repeat the question, it was sort of how do we decide what's possible and what's not? Not magic, yes. It's yeah. not magic. Yeah, I think uh, you, you start with a good list. I think like the image classification uh, uh, has gotten very good. Like there's a lot of um, open source libraries that help you with that. Natural language processing is also great. Um, uh, let me think, which ones are the, uh, the ones where we're still like scribbling a little bit? Um, I think there's like some uh, more effort being done like in video and then like in like text generation, but it's still like, if you see like the results of the models, it's still like, you know, you, you can still like see that um, probably like humans didn't like generate that. Um, the, the the fun part of like image generation, I think it's like, it makes it for a cool blog post and like for like a, a, like a cool like uh, thing to say that it's like, you know, we're seeing now like I saw like the other day like a gallery of like art art being done by deep learning. Um, and so I think it's just like a like a right now it's in like a like a play stages. Um, that that's kind of a thing. But um, I think there's like a lot of money being put into like autonomous vehicles. We're not there like a hundred percent there's a lot of uh, effort being done. Uh, a lot of uh, big companies are, are putting money to that. So I think um, we'll see when when we get there, right? Um, um, you know, I guess what I would what I would say is that um, what what is feasible depends on the expertise that you have in your organization. 
there's a basic level of machine learning, sort of straightforward you know, clustering and straightforward supervised learning uh, where you're predicting a relatively straightforward label. These are things where you can pretty much use off-the-shelf tools. You know, Amazon, Google have tools for doing this sort of general, you know, in some ways these are things that were cutting edge 10 or even 20 years ago, but are now becoming generally available and relatively accessible. You know, once you get beyond that, then it really requires having specialized expertise because these fields are moving so quickly, natural language processing and image uh, and robotics and, and reinforcement learning in particular, um, you know, these, these are areas where the state of the art is changing almost every day. So, um, so there's really a whole spectrum. Um, and so when I look at companies, you know, I'm looking to see uh, where are the areas where they're going beyond the areas that are pretty easy and do they have the expertise that will enable them to keep up? Because, uh, like I said, things are moving so quickly uh, in some of these areas that um, it's very challenging to keep up uh, in some of those areas. <laughs> Nothing anything to add there? No. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, let's see, I'll go into the side. I'll way in the back there on the. So, uh, yeah, so all this AI stuff is really cool. Um, and my question is sort of uh, not related to ROI, so it's out there to that. How important in the BCC is like concerns about privacy? And is that something that you have to consider? Because sometimes it might run counter to you know the revenue revenue generating from it. So the question is what what about concerns about privacy? But I'd probably expand the question to talk about concerns about AI in general. So there's 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 privacy, there's bias. There's a, a number of different concerns. And Christine, I know this has been an area of particular importance to you, so maybe you can speak to this yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I think, um, and it's not just like AI, right? And like as we use data and uh, we're using it to make predictions, um, how do we uh, make sure that, uh, you know, like the, the data is like secure and uh, we're uh, thinking about the, and it's sometimes it's like hard to like um, think about the consequences. Uh, there was a good example at the end of last year about the, the Strava, a world map. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but basically, um, they they just like plot it in, in in a world map the um, the runs of their users, um, and uh, you know, and it seemed like a cool idea. And like they anonymize, um, they said that they anonymize the data. So, but it was an aggregation. But what they couldn't like um, kind of uh, predict before they launched it is that actually in like um, uh, some areas, there's not that many. There's not that many like Strava users, um, and if there are, there may be like people from Western countries, and then it was very easy to identify kind of like um, uh, like uh, uh, like mission like uh, U.S. bases in uh, in some places where they were not disclosed before, um, and they look very and, you, and the map I think is still up, and if you look at it um, and you start looking at like Af Afghanistan and like some places, you just like see. A, like a round circle of like people like going around and like okay probably they didn't intend to like uh, uh, show that if that that's like a big um, security breach for uh, the U.S. military right and like the Strava team like might not have anticipated that but that it, it does have those consequences right um, so I think we uh, that the field is trying to figure out how to do that and like it, it's a very active topic in. Uh, a lot of like the research conferences, uh, how do we make sure that um, that so what it, what happens is just like the model just like amplifies what happens in society. So if like if um, humans are racist, like like that's in the data, and then like when you create the model, it might like keep amplifying that because that's like what society is. So how do you introduce not like how the world is but how would you like the like how the world should be um and and, and to like uh, uh you know like um change that that bias that's if they're intrinsically in the in the data yeah i think there was one or sorry did you have a yeah i just want to point out like there's um i don't want to plug anything but i didn't write the book but there's a book called the weapons mm -hmm. of mass destruction that describes exactly what you're talking about um, there's that famous example when Microsoft released Cortana, they, they connected her to Twitter, and within like 18 minutes she was making racial slurs or something, because like that's all the data that they, they came across Twitter. And so, uh, as we think about 
oftentimes, um, oftentimes the privacy concerns are very reactionary just because we don't know what's going to happen, right? They're all un unknown effects. So we, when we think about it, we, for investing, we think, how do we you know, keep it within the best practices and how do we do the best that we can? But you don't know what, you know, you don't know the blind hand effects. Uh, as a second point, there's a huge opportunity we see because of data and privacy to sell enterprise software. So like that's a huge area where we see where we're super excited and with what's the European um, yeah G GDPR that's coming through like all of our software companies now have European offices like selling data and security privacy solutions. Uh, let's see. Uh, how about here in the front? So are there some good use cases and success stories where the industry specific? Uh, business network is kind of coming together to solve some of the complex problems uh, and creating global data pools. So it's a business network. So like going beyond your enterprise and we are collaborating as an industry. So are there specific stories that we have seen that uh, that have been emerged? In technology development in a very long time, if ever, because so much of the competitive advantage comes from the data and not necessarily from the algorithms, there's an enorm there's a sort of a, an amazingly uh, transparent uh, um, industries and like um, and I think like a lot of the um, open source uh, libraries have enabled uh, uh, startups and uh, you know like like smaller companies that maybe don't have the they don't have the data they don't have the um, maybe the compute infrastructure and the resources but now they have the libraries to start testing things early and and and, and for free. Um, and so I think this is like one way that um, that I think like there's the collaboration in data science happening. Uh, another one uh, that I'm that I'm part of is uh, like data best practices um, with um, Data the World, Bloomberg, um, uh, and uh, Right Hive, and other companies that are coming together to like uh, also address kind of these problems of like like ethics, uh, data ethics, uh, and security and privacy, and kind of defining best practices. Um, and so I, I think uh, those are the ones I, I have experienced with. Um, I guess we, we have time for one more question. So how about far way in the back there? Maybe you can answer this. But um, from the investment side, can you talk a little bit about due diligence? You said you've gained most of your insights from the data, but how do you know the data is not being manipulated? So how do you how do you do due diligence on data uh, companies that are powered by data? Yeah, good question. Um, we probably give, I mean, on that, to answer that specific question, we probably give people too much credit. <laughs> but we, we don't, like, we, get, we, we look at the data they give us. Um, and we look at, we inter, you know, we get to know the team. Um, and we, we, one of the things, we talk to tons of customers. Customers that they provide references for, but also we use our collective network to find real customers and their potential customers and have literally 30 to 50 annual contract value, what's the churn rate, um, what's the upsell rate, um, and then depending on whether it's an enterprise contract or a per seat contract, we'll look at that. Um, but I wouldn't say, you know, I think we take people at their word for the most part. Uh, I, but I'd say the one thing is customer calls. Like, we do tons of customer calls. I guess in some ways, if the IP is theirs, it doesn't matter how it works. best in the world at doing this certainly really good. We've read their papers, we've dug in, we know them. Um, that's something, that's why I think in some ways, financial investors like co-investing with us because we actually provide actually really technical due diligence because we have people on, on the team that it's, it's their life mission and um, we collaborate with them. So we take it very seriously. In fact, our due diligence when we make investments is really intense because we want to make sure that it doesn't damage our brand, which is extremely valuable, so. Well, uh, I'm gonna close by asking each of our pick something small that is doable and implementable and you show real value. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times people, when they think about AI, they're thinking about some giant science fiction project that's gonna change everything, it's gonna take forever. But the reality is, because we're just getting started in this field, there's almost always something that can be implemented in as, in as little as maybe 60 to 90 days that can deliver concrete value um, so with like what's the problem, what's the goal, um, and then like um, uh, you know um, go to a data scientist and, and ask them like how can they solve that uh, that problem, but not the other way around.
I think in early markets, and this is still an early market, evolving market, you're going to get a lot of innovation budgets that are interested in buying experimental, what's, what's the AI do, what's the neural network do, and kind of picking them into the business to, to use that. But for us, that's not a great indicator of long-term product uh, market fit or long-term company success. So I'd say if you get the innovation budget, great. Then tie it down to revenue, making money or saving money, and focus on that and just sell, 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 sell directly to their revenue line. Um, and that will help you develop the product to be a, a market fit product um, and grow from there. In the industrial world, not consumer, but in the industrial world, I think one of the most important pieces is understanding change management and why would people champion your idea, your product. Um, it, it really doesn't necessarily matter how good your product is. If you can't have someone champion it and be willing to change how they do their business, it's, it's probably going to fail. So well, that's why many of us will hire suboptimal firms or ideas because at least they can, we have champions. Um, that to me is a really, change management is by far the biggest issue. That's why McKinsey and all these guys are still in business and get paid a lot of money because they know exactly what the real problem is and like Center Interactive is sponsoring South by Southwest is they're the ones that go to the, to the industrial world saying, hey, we understand how to help you guys navigate this. So I think one of the things, for especially your technologists, is spend a lot of time thinking about who you're selling to and why would they be willing to take a bullet for you internally. And if you can figure that out, you're probably already uh, onto something huge. Awesome, that's a really great way to, to wrap up. We have the room for another half hour or so. 55 minutes. Um, so you're welcome to hang out. We're happy to Let's talk go. some more, those of us. Um, and thank you very much, we really appreciate your coming. Thank you. Good job.